Will the Collective Cast is the official podcast of the Reform Collective. Views expressed by the hosts and guests do not necessarily represent or the collective as a whole. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. God foreknows, predestines, calls, justifies, glorifies, but he will not lose them. That's the promise. No Christian should walk with a judgmental swagger because we did not work out our own salvation. It was given by a God of compassion and mercy. Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody to our show tonight. Go ahead and get your Bibles out. Get ready to flip through the passages. But let me tell you a little bit about the show. This yeah. is Reform Collective, the biblical perspectives. This show is necessary because folks have gotten reckless, gotten reckless with agendas, with agendas, and twisting scriptures, with ignoring scriptures. the glory that we find in Christ's redemption. Bad doctrine, we refute it. We'll exegete the text with the proper hermeneutic, systematic context, truth and love. That's how we do it. And now to Josh and Jason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome to the modern reformation. We need to deliver ourselves from the bondage of prayerless praying and learn to take up, as the Reformers and Puritans did, their mantle of prayer and dependency on the Holy Spirit, and storm the mercy seat, and take the kingdom of heaven by violence, for the violent take it by force. Welcome to the Collective Cast. I'm Jason, and this is where we talk about Reformed writing, podcasting, culture, and just about anything we want. i got a special guest on today. Um, he is the head editor for the Reformed Collective. Um, his name is Daler Tesoto. Um, Daler, say say hi to everybody. Hi, uh, yeah, this is uh, Taylor D. Soto. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, it, it's going good, man. It's going good. We uh, kind of made this like a last minute podcast thing um, because Josh bailed on me again. So that's like two Ooh. episodes in a row, you know, two strikes. whatever. Two strikes, you're out. That's how it works in baseball, right? I mean, what, is a, what does a pastor have to do anyway? I mean, why can't he make the time? Yeah. What is Josh that's a pastor? A I believe so, Josh Summer. I don't think so. No. Oh, some uh, some preaching once. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he was in, he was invited um to oh. preach at a place. Um, okay. And he, I think so he's now public service. Yeah, public supply. Okay. Yeah, and and he also. Uh, gosh, what what else? Um, he's now becoming or coming on staff at a church as well. So. Brad, but he's so not he's in the, he's in the that that makes i think that's what i was thinking about there, yeah you know? yeah but anyways um yeah josh totally bailed on yep. me um and you know i'm just wow. gonna cry here in my room but whatever um but i have taylor on today and i've always wanted to have taylor on for a long time um but today specifically we're going to talk about christian excellency we're going to talk about excellency in the arts um in the sciences uh academia and and even in just our little christian circles um just being excellent at what what we like to do a lot of people will um call this protestant work ethic um but i think it it goes farther than that um in just going back to that whole thing of glorifying God and absolutely everything that we do, whether it's explicitly quote unquote Christian or um, just being Christians in a world. Um, and just know that uh, Taylor today is going to be coming at you from a beautiful post millennial perspective. So uh, all of you yeah. um, hashtag that post mill people in the crowd um, will finally get to uh, hear your um, hear your spokesperson. So it, he literally represents everything that postmillennialism does. If you don't agree with him, then you are uh, now dispensational. That's how that works, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's exactly how it works. So, <laughs> uh, so Taylor, uh, super excited to have you on today. And honestly, I wanted to have you on for this topic. I thought of you when I thought of this topic because um, this is just kind of one of your soapboxes. This is this is one of your talking yeah. points. This is something that is really really important to you. So, I, I guess my first question for you is: Wait, no, hold on. This is your first time on the show, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to skip the icebreaker question because I know you hate them, but I um, just wanted everyone to know that this is your first time on the podcast. Okay. Anyways, the question I want to ask you, first question, introductory question. Um, how many different ways can I introduce this question? Why is it so important for Christians to do well in the things that they do? So when when Christians do things well, we 
we ultimately get things like mass communication. We get things like mass transit and education and hospitals. Uh, that framework that America was built upon and the, the sciences that resulted uh, from that, that, uh, that learning and teaching gave us the modern culture that we have, the advancements in medicine. When Christians do well in the, the culture uh, and in the sciences, of the whole world benefits and all people benefit. Um, and I, I think what we've seen, and this is a little bit outside of the reach of the question, but I think we've seen Christians withdraw a little bit from the culture mm. and the sciences. Yeah. So th- it seems like, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like there are two extremes. And I think we would both um, fall somewhere in, on the spectrum in between these extremes, um, not actually sitting on the poles, but the two extremes are to completely become. Um, monastic and completely forget about the culture, create your own culture and say, we're Christians, we're not of the world, and we're not in it. Right. Um, and then you have the other side that is kind of um, they no longer have a distinctive Christian taste to them. And when they're in the world, they are now also of the world. And they say things right. like, um, well, I'm j- you know, I can, I can really step into this space and redeem it. And it's like, there's some places that can be redeemed right. obviously. Um, but you don't no, need to be going and trying to start a Christian brothel, you know? Right. And, and, I, and that's a, that's a very much a very uh, extreme case that I, I don't think anyone in their right mind is trying to make a case for, but I'm, you know, right. throwing that extreme out there to show that there's some people that tend towards that. Um, and you know, I, I might find myself a little bit on the drawing myself out um, from the culture thing, just because I guess of my uh, two kingdom theology, I recognize my deficiencies in that, um, in that regard. But um, yeah, th- you definitely made a good point talking about, you know, withdrawing from the culture. So what is something that us as Christians can do um, better than we are doing right now. And I mean, like in a specific area, what area do you think that Christians are really lacking in that they can really step into better in the very, very near future? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think first of all, checking your worldview, right? Uh, uh, there, there's a difference between standing firmly on the Bible and, and bringing that into the culture and stepping off the Bible onto the secular worldview and trying to engage them on their platform, right? Uh, I, I think w- when you do that, you lose your foundation and you lose your definition of excellency. You're, you're borrowing from the from the secular worldview, and and when that happens, you lose all sorts of all sorts of truth. And, and in the immediate term, right? If you're a student or you're in, in the workplace, you have vocational. Uh, obligations. I, I think the way that we uh, really come back into the culture is is by by being uh, that that excellent student and and being that excellent uh, coworker, uh, that that person that brings value to your team. Uh, and I think the re- that's a result of of doing all things to the glory of God. Right? How how uh, how are you glorifying God if you're late to work 15 minutes every day? Right. How how uh, how glorifying to God is it to to uh, not study for an exam and fail it? Right. You're 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 putting you're, you're putting uh, subpar performance in the same exact boat as as God's standards when you do that, and everyone looks at that boat and says, you know, that's God's standard. You can show up 15 minutes to work to, uh, late to work, and so in the short term, I think what we do is is we become excellent stewards of what God has given us. So, so the first step is whatever you are in right now, you know, whatever um, roles you have in life, whether it be student or um, student or employee or employer or or whatever it is, be excellent in that. Because when people see you, they see, they see, when they see your work and they see what you're about, they see what Christ is about. Right, right. Uh, first Peter 3.15 says, uh, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Right? That's the assumption that you have hope, right? That when people look upon you, they say, what is different about that person? Why, mm-hmm. uh, why are they living life in that way? Um, that, that's not to say, you know, the whole 
preach the gospel and when you have to use words. That's not what that means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, definitely use your, uh, use your words to preach gospel because that's necessary. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. It comes by hearing. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I'm glad you uh, pull out the KJV version of that because the ESV d- uh, doesn't count there. So the, uh, well, the KJV, I was talking to, uh, about this with my pastor today. Mm -hmm. Uh, was written in such a way that that was meant to be memorized because at the time there was low literacy rates, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's written in this very poetic sort of uh, flowy way that 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 uh, made it easier to 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 recall and to memorize. So a lot of my scripture uh, came uh, memorization came from reading the KJV when I first uh, came to faith. Absolutely, absolutely. I I always I've always contended that my favorite version. I, I have different. I have and just to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail. Um, I have favorite versions for different things. So my favorite version to read through the Psalms in is the KJV, and my f- favorite um, version to read through the New Testament in is the ESV. And my favorite um, version to listen to is the NLT, and you know, stone me for that one. And uh, no. my favorite version to um, to actually um, look at some of those Old Testament narratives in is the NIV again stone me for that yeah. one too well and don't forget you know when you're around a bonfire uh and everyone's singing spiritual songs and and uh lavishing each other with encouragement and prayer uh to throw that message bible on the bonfire keep it fueled absolutely absolutely <laughs> throw in eugene peterson too right can we throw in him no that's murder huh? we can't throw in eugene peterson too <laughs> we we cannot do that <laughs> yeah we, we can't do that okay I, I believe he, he actually to give the man credit has a, a lot of excellent literature on pastoral ministry um, he does he does i think he just really really uh, missed the mark on, uh, yeah and then he's phrase. had some controversial statements later uh um lately that um we have no idea what his actual stance is so there's that there that seems uh, to be the common trend right now for pastors to kind of go off the deep end. So I don't really know what's happening there. Yeah, yeah, kind of like your former pastor, right? Oh, <laughs> Mark Driscoll. Yeah, that's Ooh, correct. Mark Driscoll. Yeah, he's a. Uh, it's actually funny. He's he planted a church here in my my hometown of Phoenix. He's, I think he's in Scottsdale, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. Running so away from the church. We don't really. We don't really uh, surprisingly, no one really talks about it too much. I haven't, really? I haven't actually heard wind of his church, uh, so I don't, I'm not not sure how that's going. We'll have to do a episode where I would invite on Marky Mark and I uh, ask him why he abandoned his flock and started a new one. But you know, whatever. Uh, open the op- open the uh, the interview with uh, Mark Driscoll first of all, and then play the clip where he says, "How dare you?" Oh, uh, that'll be absolutely, ex- absolutely. Ex- well, I mean, he curses in that in that section too, so I'll have to uh, I'll have to warn the listeners if they're uh, if if they're offended by the the mild D word. Well, I think I, I actually really word. enjoyed that, that sermon. Uh, I, I, in a lot of ways, Mark Driscoll shaped my reformed faith, you know, brought me to a Calvinistic uh, oh, same. perspective. Yeah. And uh, I, I think he's absolutely right. Men who abuse women and take advantage of their uh, position as a man and the head of you know, the, the wife, who in the hell do you think you are? Yeah. Right? Yeah, man. I mean, that's exactly I, what he I, said. I think, I, think he, I think that was absolutely apt yeah it's definitely warranted I, I definitely think it is um and he and he um he shaped a little bit of um my reform faith as well um it's just unfortunate that he couldn't carry over that pastoral wisdom um and passion right. when it came to how he treated his elders so right right and yeah. uh that's i i think uh you know we're still in this rabbit hole but just to finish that thought really quickly mm-hmm. uh, i i think that's what's so important even as you know, the head pastor of a very large church, you need accountability and you need to uh, not surround yourself with men who just tell you yes, right? You yeah. need people that are going to challenge you and are going to tell you, hey, uh, that, that was wrong. Uh, you need to repent of that or you, you need to apologize. You need to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And I, I think uh, you, you cannot surround yourself with men who are going to tell you that everything you do is right. Yep. Yes, men are just going to lead you down a terrible path terrible path anyways um and and that almost has nothing to do with what we're talking about i guess um <laughs> i mean excellency in, in the church well actually no there. no actually th- th- this does actually bring up a really good point um just going not to mark driscoll but to you know the former mars hill in in general um one thing that mars hill church did so well was actually cultivate this 
this environment of Christian excellency when it came to music. Um, yeah. There were a, a ridiculous amount of musicians either that came into the church or came out of the church or a little bit of both um, that, that had great combinations of like congregational singing and worship and just like general Christian music. Um, and, 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 but they did it in such a way that they were actually good at it. Like musically right. they were good at it, you know, and, and, and they didn't sacrifice their musicality, um, in order to be more palatable. So for instance, Chris Tomlin is an incredibly gifted uh, singer and songwriter, but the thing is he keeps everything so cookie cutter because his right. his audience has to have something so palatable. Whereas Bars Hill said, hey, this is going to be kind of hard at first to get used to what we're doing here, but we're not sacrificing um, excellency in, in, um, in music and um, in, in how we, you know, in music and in lyricism, just to make it more palatable. Yes, we're going to make sure it's not, um, we're not, you know, doing fast uh, trap music. So we, we, everyone raps along really quickly um, in the middle of worship, of course. But um, right. th that was something, you know, a little connection there that actually I wanted to make at some point. So uh, what do you, what do you think about what has come out of Mars Hill music wise? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, music is i was just meeting with someone in my church yesterday who uh, was touring with a band called ann arbor and this is one of those guys who's a solid christian solid believer uh who really uses his music to engage uh, a culture that's largely unchurched and i i think that right now the christian music industry is so washed with just the evangelical mindset right the the be your best man by Friday kind of evangelical Christian uh, nonsense uh, that, that you have entire songs that, that just don't contain any sort of gospel truth, but are played on Caleb mm -hmm. and are, are played on these Christian radio shows. And I think, you know, you have bands like King's Kaleidoscope and citizens who uh, are, are remaking hymns and are, are doing that well. Right. Uh, I believe King's Kaleidoscope was at the the U campus, which is uh, you know a liberal town in Seattle, college town, right? And they're they're singing hymns, uh, but mm -hmm. in such a way that that is, is uh, engaging to you know and, and relevant to this 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 uh, musical culture we're in. Um, so I, I think they bring a lot of the, like weight in their theology and their songs, and that's something that uh, I think the Christian musical culture doesn't have right now. Um, but but you're starting to see more of you're you're starting to see more of that, and I think that uh, Marcel's music uh, label really brought that into the marketplace. Um, you have a a band right now. I'll just plug them real quick. They're called My Soul Among Lions. Uh, they're they're going through the Psalter right now. Um, they're mm -hmm. a folk band, and they're just going straight through the Psalter. I think they're on year thirty right now, making the album, and I love it. Uh, and I love that that bands are saying, "Hey, let's take a look at historical music. Let's take a look at the Psalter, and and let's let's uh, let's let's throw our artistic style on that, and, and do it with excellence." So, what was the name of that band again? I want to look it up so I can leave it in the show notes. My soul among lions. My soul among lions. What a name! What a name! Right. My soul among lions. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to leave that in the show notes, and I'll have to check that out as well. Um, and yeah. Taylor does not um, recommend things uh, very often. He doesn't give his stamp of approval um, on everything. I will say so. it's not for everybody. It's very uh, folky and in, in, uh, in a lot of places kind of country. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's not your gig. Either way, listen to it. Everyone should be uh, listening to a Psalter, singing this Psalter. I think it's a very healthy practice, a very biblical practice. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and if you want to hear a little bit more about um singing the psalms um actually you can refer back to one of our first episodes um and it was actually um an interview that we did with christian herring over ex exclusive psalmody now of course taylor and i are not exclusive psalm uh psalmists psalmodists um uh, but psalmodists psalmodist? yeah, but anyways uh <laughs> christian who's also on the reform collective one of our writers um he um just talked about just like the benefits of um the singing the psalms as well and and the deep uh, rich theological truth and you don't have to be an exclusive psalmist to realize that we need to be singing in the psalms so right right there's that sing a psalm sim spiritual songs right yeah that's it's like a, it, it's like there's three of them 
Right. Wait, don't you mean Psalms, Psalms, and Psalms? Uh, yes, that's what I said. <laughs> that's that's what you said. That's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Oh gosh. That's that's a that's another rabbit hole that we're not going to go down. But um, and and I do want to preface to anybody listening that we're also not recommending all of the music that has come out of Mars Hill because unfortunately, literally my favorite singer songwriter of all time. Um, lead singer of thrice has kind of gone down the deep end as well. Um, theologically, um, Dustin Kensrue, he's had some great stuff. Um, I think he, he wrote with King's Kaleidoscope and citizens, all glory be to Christ. Um, and he also wrote, um, gosh, what's uh, grace alone. Um, yeah. Wonderful and, song. Yeah. Just fantastic songs that I wouldn't discredit, but I, I would, um, caution anybody who, you know, looks, into Dustin Kinzer to realize that he has been going very liberal theologically um, lately. So um, denying inerrancy in not just small historic ways, but very um, not good ways, um, denying right. infallibility. So anyways, just want to uh, preface that in case anybody thinks that we're, I'm just going to give them a, a pass wholesale or something like that. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the ordinary, and the the arts but i remember one of the things that you were talking about is the need for christians to be more involved in academia um right. what why like like who cares why do christians need to be in academia right now uh we have a, a situation in academia right you have educational institutions that were founded by christians by uh by people of faith uh, and and the that those institutions are no longer uh, being faithful to the word of God. And, and it's solely because Christians have left academia. Uh, and what you'll find, and I think what uh, the numbers show is that it's not that there's not enough Christians. It, it, it's that the Christians aren't speaking up anymore. Um, we're, we're afraid to say abortion is murder. We're afraid to say that, uh, that Romans one is true. You know, that homosexuality isn't, God's design, right? Yeah. We're afraid to say that. We're afraid uh, to to speak bold truth into academia, and, and as a result, you have uh, you have unbiblical worldview being taught everywhere, and and as a result, now uh, institutions like Cornell, very prestigious university, um, who have biology teachers who don't believe in science, right? They they believe in subjectivity and you know, when people who believe in subjectivity are teaching the, the minds of our future, the doctors of our future, we run into some very dangerous grounds there. And uh, uh, ultimately, we need, to, we need to, if you're a Christian in academia, speak up. You, you need to say something. You need to, you need to publish. You need to say, hey, look, I'm an in intelligent, studied individual. And what's going on right now is not founded on truth. It's founded on what we feel and, and what uh, our emotions are telling us. And I think that's very dangerous. Yeah, man, I, I really appreciate how you tied in the, um, the recent culture uh, in academia of bringing subjectivity um, to the forefront and leaving objectivity behind. So because th there's, there's people who have been saying, Hey, there's like 56 genders and there might even be more really. It's just whatever you think you are. And then, you know, Christians will speak back into that or just anybody in their right mind speaks back to that. And they're like, well, well, no, like just like biologically, let's not even look at this spiritually. Let's look at this biologically um, and, and biologically it's male and female. And then you have people again, like at Cornell who are basically just saying, Oh, well, science has been bigoted and um, science hasn't taken into account people's experiences enough. And it's like, but that's not what science is about. Science is objectively about the facts. And, and we're getting to the point where Christians um, know that there's something wrong with that and they disagree with that, but they're just kind of just staying back in their corner, like you said, in their Christian ghettos and, and deciding that, okay, well, the liberal academics, and when I say liberal, I don't mean, you know, like, oh, you, you're a Democrat. And I mean, like, just in terms of worldview, these academics 
we just let them do what, what, what they want. And we send, and I don't have children, but when the time comes, um, I'm not sending my children to those centers. You know, th- those are places where, um, I digress. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but the Christians just are withdrawing um, from the culture too much. And again, I'm not, it, this isn't me coming at it from some post-millennial reconstructionist uh, viewpoint. This is me just looking at it as a Christian saying like, Hey, there's something wrong here and we're just allowing it to happen in the culture. Um, and we're not right. saying anything about it. And if anything, we're at least called to be a prophetic voice. Right. Well, and you said something very interesting. You said that biologically you have male and female, right? Yes. Uh, but even more importantly, you have Genesis, which says yeah, absolutely. God, God created man and it was, he was good. And God created woman. She was good. Right. That, that's where we get our definition of man and woman. That's we, we don't get our, we don't get our definition of man and woman by X, 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 Y. Right. We, we, yeah, we, yeah. we first and foremost are foundationally a, a biblical people. We uh, believe that, that what God says about the, the world, about our metaphysic, is true. Uh, we, we believe that what God says about our uh, epistemology, the way we learn things is true. And we believe that what God says about our ethic is true. And, and when you start there, you can then begin to I- engage the culture. Um, you, you can't go over to, you know, the, the secular logic that says, okay, let's be neutral. Yeah, there, let's, there's let's no be, neutrality. Let's, let's be neutral here. And, you know, Bonson, uh, one of my, one of my favorite uh, men of the faith, um, He's he you know, he's home now, uh, but but said there's no such thing as neutrality. So uh, fundamentally, when you engage academia, when you engage an intellectual, you, you have to realize that they're presupposing a worldview. And, and if you take a new a, a you know quote unquote neutral stance, you're going to you're going to be eaten alive. Hmm. Uh, you, you're going to be eaten alive. You need yeah. to found yourself firmly on, on the word of God if if you want to have it even a a slight hope of, of turning around the, the academic culture. Yeah. And that's, uh, you hit it right on the head. Just talking about the myth of neutrality. There is no, um, th- there is no middle ground on this. And, you know, the reason why I mentioned the biological aspect is just because, you know, we were talking about science here and, you know, right. e- even if you removed God from the situation, which you can't, um, either what God says is true or what, it, or it's not, um, but even if you just looked at it from the like just the chromosomal part, we're seeing that in the Romans one situation, what people see it in, in is just very this natural knowledge that is is known to people. They are completely rejecting and throwing out in favor for They're suppressing the truth, the suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Um, yeah. And, you know, even though they will not call on him as their God. He is their God and they will be judged for it one day. Right. Um, and, and somebody has to speak prophetically into that. Um, yeah, and amen. if it's not Christians, then it's nobody. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So we talked about um, Christian excellency in art and in academics um, and in, in music. Well, I guess music would be the arts. Um, we talked about just like in the ordinary, mundane, everything. But what does it look like for Christians to be excellent in the church? What does it mean for excellent for Christians to be excellent to each other? Uh, well, that's that's a that's a very big question. Uh, I, I think first I'm going to preface this with saying that I think churches have gotten too large. I, I think that uh, churches have become unsustainable. Um, I think that the fact you can walk into a church, be seen by nobody, be heard by nobody, and leave is a tragedy. Uh, church was meant to be your community, who you lived with, who you feasted with, um, and and you you know you can go to a church, and if you don't like what you hear, you can go to another church, and if you don't like what you hear, or if if someone tells you you need to repent, you can just go to another church. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's not, by and large, uh, churches that are stewarding people well. Yeah, and uh, I, I have such a high esteem for for reformed churches because they, by and large, are doing that. They're they're holding people accountable. They're 
uh, they're 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 feeding people. They have there's Sunday school and there there's small groups and there's there's genuine fellowship happening. Uh, and I'm not that's not to say that a large church can't do that, right? Um, large churches do that very well sometimes, but mm-hmm. but I think what excellence looks like in the church is holding the pulpit to a high esteem, revering uh, the position of pastor in the sense that the pastor's responsibility is to not only deliver the truth from the word of God, but also to to shepherd his people. And uh, even lower than that, deacons. Deacons, what is a deacon? You go to a church and and what does a deacon do? They hold the door. They say hi to people. Um, They pass out the, the, the Eucharist elements, right? But I think I think what we need to start seeing from churches is deacons being the people to deliver meals to the to the new mothers and and uh, to take care of the widows. And we need to see elders stewarding the people spiritually. And uh, we we've we've moved in such a direction that I think we've lost that a little bit. We've we've lost the personal care that the church is supposed to bring to its people and i think if we we start there if we actually care about the worldview of our of our churchgoers and we care about the spiritual life of our churchgoers we're going to start seeing impacts on the immediate community so you're an elder at your church what is ex what does excellency look like for you yeah, uh, I, I think it looks like being transparent, letting people know uh, what I'm doing, right? And letting people know what I'm reading, what I'm learning, what I'm struggling with, what I need prayer for, uh, being mentored, right? My accountability, who, who is pouring into me, letting that be known. So if, if, if someone has a problem with something that I do, they can go to that person and say, hey, look, this is what Taylor did. Uh, you, you need to you need to talk to him, right? Or and and um, as as an elder, I have a responsibility to be in the scriptures and to uh, be a man of one wife, right? And uh, steward my family well. I've got a little girl on the way, and, and you know, let my family be a witness to my spiritual walk, right? Let let the spiritual growth of my wife speak for my marriage. You know, let her. Let, let her glory be my glory. And, and uh, that, that's all I strive to be is, is that I would not take that lightly. Um, obviously, I don't have all the answers to that question, but that's kind of what I'm trying to do is just submit myself to the scriptures, submit myself to authority, and uh, never, be above, never be below reproach. Well, Taylor, um, thanks for coming on to just talk about excellency and in in all these different um, in all these different areas of the Christian life. Um, and for anybody listening, I'll, I'll leave a bunch of show notes of articles and and songs and and books and whatnot for you guys to follow. Um, but just thanks for listening to this episode, guys. Um, if you enjoyed anything that we talked about or even just put up with us, head over to reformcollective.com, where Taylor DeSoto is actually. Um, our head editor. So if you see like a typo, make sure to email <laughs> us at reform collective uh, at gmail.com and say like, Hey, one of your editors is slipping up. What's going on? Uh, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash reform collective. I um, mean, you can find us on Twitter at ref collect. That's R E F C O L L E C T. Uh, tell your friends about the show. If you enjoyed it and if you hated it, tell your friends anyway, you might have Lutheran friends or Presbyterian friends. That's why I say every week, they might just love the things you hate and hate the things you love. Um, just like Taylor and I on some things sometimes. Uh, look us up on iTunes and give us a five star review. Any closing words from you, Taylor? Uh, there's thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, do all things to the glory of God. Absolutely. Oh, Amen. Say. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next time. This episode of the Collective Cast is sponsored by One Ten Marketing. 
110 Marketing specializes in social media management and advertising, web design, and email marketing. Adam and Dustin can help you and your business improve your reach via Facebook ads, online reviews, and even podcast help. Go to 110marketing.com for your personal and business marketing needs. That's 110marketing.com. 